So you like saying Bolt could have been here? Uh, Bolt was here. He was here, right. Do you and know so... what the first question everybody asked? Where he stayed. <laughs> where, where did he stay? Vesta <laughs> <laughs> House, over there. Best, so, he, yeah. so he was just off Victory Plaza, as, yeah. as you would expect. Yeah. Joining me on Changemakers today is Rick DeBlaby, the chief executive of Get Living, the built to rent pioneers with a mission to change renting for the better. I caught up with Rick at the iconic East Village. It's right at the heart of the London 2012 Olympic site. So where else could I begin but by releasing my inner end people, searching for the hero within, and I asked Rick, what does it mean to go for gold? You're having something very, uh, very healthy there, right, yeah. Rick. Um, what is it? It's called a fresh start. A, fr a fresh start. That's, that's juice number thirty-two. Sounds like a, sounds like a business plan. <laughs> <laughs> but it, 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 it felt like we came in, and it felt it felt like remember Cheers, that um, TV show, yeah, like, indeed. where everybody knows your name. I mean, it felt like you know. I mean, a you obviously eat here a lot. <laughs> I have done in the past for a number of years. Yeah, and, but, and Gold Run's a wonderful place. And I suppose you know these are the sorts of neighbourhood businesses that spring up in the wake of a development like this yeah I mean they they, they take time to establish yeah. um, and we've always been uh, very keen to support businesses like this uh, especially through that sort of COVID era mm. uh, and obviously as more and more people move into East Village as we develop more of it uh, you know the the audience yeah. gets bigger so hopefully their businesses thrive on the back of it but I really like this I mean this is like you know this is a real this is a unique Small business that is, you know. Well, the thing, the thing here about East Village and, and the other places we do, apart from Sainsbury's, there are no big multiple national So these are here. all local they're artisans, all, local all retailers, exactly local that. food. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and how do the businesses find, find them? I mean, are these like local local retailers or yeah. are they? Yeah. Right, so they, okay, so how do they, how do they find you? Just the um, serendipity or? No, it's, 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 it's a bit more scientific than right. that. We've, we've got a team of people and we use you know, the agency world to find the audiences that we're really after and the, and the different brands and offerings that go into make a village. I mean, yeah. you've, got, you've got probably uh, the thick end of 8,000 people living in East Village. That's a town in its own right. Yeah. And you, know, you go to any town so of what, what size people. town would that be? That's sort of like a sort of like decent size sort of um, street in town, Somerset, yeah, 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 somewhere like that, yeah. yeah. And yeah. You go down those streets and you've got everything, haven't you? Yeah. That's, it's, that's the joy of these things. Well, I mean, and what you've got here, I mean, I'll just, you know, we've just walked down this, this whole boulevard here. I mean, you've got an amazing array of, of, of one-off stores and yeah. restaurants and cafes, yeah. which is a, a really good, well, I suppose, is your fresh start there, Rick? I Here's mean, my fresh start. Let's start with a, um, a Yorkshire Post article that um, described you as the mojo man. I oh think my that's goodness. A I think that's a really good phrase, right? Mojo. I mean, um, spirit, magic, life power, energy. Um, there's, there's something about that that's in your character, but also here where we are, the, the site of the 2012 Olympics. Yeah, look, East Village has got a mojo. Uh, it all sprang from those 2012 Olympic and yeah. Paralympic Games which was a massive moment for the country, I think. Well, let's search for the hero within yourself. I mean, this was the, this was the Olympian's village. Um, it, it was, but, absolutely um, right. And, um, um, I mean, you were at the opening ceremony with no idea how your life was going to change so soon after. But let's go back to that moment of 2012, because I often think, like, when, when we think about, like, feel good, and you think about a moment in time where everybody would agree that the UK felt fantastic. Yeah. I think 2012 was it. What did it feel like being at the opening ceremony? It was amazing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, not just the spectacle of, you know, 100,000 people in a stadium uh, and all of the ceremony and, and joy that goes with that. Uh, I mean, some of the people that spoke, yeah. uh, I mean, 
Sebastian Coe speaking at it. it. It was one of those Spine moments. Spine tingling. Yeah, it was. Yeah. yeah, I think as a country, we really thought, <clears throat> right, you know, we're, yeah. we're the focus of the world here. This is, a, this is a celebration of everything that's great about mankind. Yeah. Uh, and, and in terms of, um, you know, companionship, but competition, uh, about excelling, uh, about all the preparation that went into that for this, you know, great moment. Uh, and, and I think you're right that the country felt really good at that point. Yeah, I mean, and a lot of things I'm, I'm sure you'll want to talk about with relation to your own business were, were there in full display, you know, the idea about us belonging, togetherness. I mean, I suppose, you know, the athletics was amazing, but the sense of community, the sense of bonding, the sense of, I suppose, pride in place that actually we wanted to showcase ourselves to the world. Yeah, I think there was pride in everything, wasn't there? I mean, there was definitely pride in what we as London, yeah. as what we as, as Great Britain had sort of staged at that time. Massive pride in our <laughs> and we athletes. we won medals. And we <laughs> won medals galore. But I think massive pride in the fact that we brought everybody together. And I think, don't forget, the Paralympic Games were amazing too. Mm. I mean, I think that, again, was real pride in what humans can achieve in, in sometimes difficult circumstances. Yeah. It, it was just a model of, uh, you know, exemplary preparation, commitment, professionalism, uh, and, and actual execution on the day. Because it's worth saying is that in, in a lot of other cities, the legacy of the Olympics has not been one that, that they're very proud of. You know, I mean, so, so I, mean, what, I suppose what made people determined to make this one different, that it actually was going to become a vibrant place for people to live and work? Yeah, I, I th actually, I think when you look back, it was, a, it was a real case study of how public and private partnerships work at their very, very best. Mm. And actually, I've had the Olympic Committee come back 10 years after, it's last year actually, yeah. um, and had a look at it. And London is often held up as the exemplar for new bids that want to host the Olympics yeah. as to what a legacy can, can become. Because I suppose, you know, back to Mojo, I mean, they're there to catalyse that Mojo, aren't they? And to sort of like, you know, help communities and places and nations not just put on the sporting event, but build a genuine sense of legacy. Look, you know, these things cost billions to yeah. launch. Uh, if, if you're going to spend billions of pounds worth of taxpayers' money, um, make it last for more than two weeks. Make it last for generations. Well, absolutely. I mean, I was, I was here a few weeks ago watching West Ham play Sheffield United. I mean, you know, it was a, obviously thought they probably put the wrong team in that stadium, but I mean, they did beat us 4-0. But I mean, I did get this <laughs> sense of like, an amazing place to be yeah. and to sort of go on to be able to watch premiership football or, you know, the sort of like, I suppose you've got here East in terms of the sort of the technology campus, yeah. you've got, you've got Sadler's Wells, you've got Stratford. I mean, it, it is transformed in the living memory of most people, this part of London and has created a and, new... And not just that, new, Michael, it is still yeah, transforming. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I mean, this story is not written yet. Mm. Um, it's not complete yet. Uh, and you can go to the Copper Box, you can go to the swimming pool, uh, you can go to the velodrome. They're all used all of the time and they still look amazing. Yeah. You've obviously, I suppose, created a whole category in, in Build to Rent. I mean, the, the, these properties are very particular. They're not people coming and, and buying a home. They're actually coming in and living here as a resident um, in terms of a get living property. I mean, tell us a little bit about, about that, especially from the perspective that, you know, when they talk about like a, an English person's home as their castle, you know, that, 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 that idea that, you know, property ownership being ingrained in the, in the psyche, you, you're, you're, you're changing the narrative a bit. I guess if we were in Paris or Berlin, the idea of renting your home would be perfectly normal, would, perfectly normal and yeah. would be very, very normal. Yeah. In, in the UK, I guess you've had to overcome some barriers in terms of making the case that this is a new way of doing things. Yeah, I mean, we certainly started with the mission of disrupting the rental market, because if you talk to, if you took a vox pop of most people that rented, there was an insecurity of tenure, there was a sort of um, indiscriminate rent increases, there were lots of mm -hmm. fees and deposits, and the landlord was quite often absent and the repair uh, provision wasn't very good and all the rest of it. So we started with that, that vision of wanting to disrupt the market and, and say to people, look, you can have security of tenure, the, the rent increases annually, uh, there's no big fees, uh, and we're here to fix anything. So mm. the light bulb goes, you go on the app, you call us up, uh, and we come around to fix it straight away. But I, I think that proposition moved on quite quickly because I, I I've always been of the view that the proposition people value on the way in 
is different to the proposition people value when they're in it. Right. Yep. And they... they what, they, so less bricks and mortar? Well, they, more... they look at it and it's a beautiful flat uh, and it's got lots of amenities and we're here and, you know, the process of the transaction, which is very electronic these days, uh, was all um, impressive, if yeah. you like. But when what, what keeps people here is the fact that um, they feel safe, they've got great transportation, but mostly they make friends yeah. and they start putting down roots mm. and it feels like home. So it feels like home. And how do you make sure that that home integrates more widely and isn't just a sort of island unto itself? I mean, do you get a sense that you are able to sort of create more connectivity, more kind of, I suppose, destination um, development in terms of actually being part of the bigger whole. A lot of real estate people talk about building communities and building yeah. neighborhoods. And I've always felt we create the stage for right. people to build communities and build neighborhoods. You know, because it's the human look drama, right? Yeah. It's the human drama that creates that. Exactly. The and, and you know, I think we learned that lesson in the early days because we were always trying to curate these big events, which we thought everybody would come along to. And in, in truth, it was a bit too synthetic. It was a bit mm. too imposed. If you create the stage and people start to get to know each other, they start making their own events, they start making their own lives, they start making their own social contacts, yeah. and, and, and they, 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 they build the sort of life they particularly choose for themselves. And everybody's got different interests. And so when you, when you create that stage and you facilitate the circumstances for it to happen, that's when the real magic starts to occur. Yeah. And I suppose, you know, the, I suppose the, the clue is in the name, right? You know, get living. Um, you know, that is another part of the feel good message. I'll right? tell you whoever Which came it, up with that name. <laughs> was it not you? I, it wasn't. <laughs> and I'd love to meet them and shake their hand. Yeah. Well, it's a great name, right? You know, because actually, I suppose it's, it's a sort of, it's a call to action. Yeah. Which, um, totally. which is about that actually where we live, how we live, why we live. I mean, these are all, these are all the big questions, yeah. right? Um, is this sort of development a reflection on the dynamism of the, way, of the wider place, do you think? Well, I think if you, if you take East Village in particular, we can talk about some of the others. East Village uh, was actually a bit on its own. I mean, mm. when you look out the window now and you can see all of the things that are going on around us. So East Bank, down towards Leighton, Chopper yeah. Manor, they've all followed. So um, it was in a sense, the catalyst for all of the things that are going on in right. East London so it right it actually now. was... It, it, it really was. It was the, it was yeah. the stone in the mill uh, pond. Yeah. But it's, it's always remained the hub, I, I mm. think, and, and all of these things have sort of occurred around it. So, so was it... Did, did people feel like they were... I mean, did they feel like they were, I suppose, a pioneer community? In a well, OK, so you're touching on a really interesting yeah. point because I think what we've seen at East Village and what we now see in the other neighbourhoods that we've been building up is that your first cohort, your first season or two, are your pioneers. Yeah. You get quite a lot of students come in. You get, you know, your, your, your people that are more mobile and are willing to sort of try these places out. But actually, what's, a lot of people start coming here as a right. sharer. But you bring a younger dimension into it. You into bring a, a younger dimension. Right. Yeah. But those people that share have a relationship. They then yeah. start moving into a one bed with their partner. Uh, and actually, what you see now, and if we go outside, you'll see lots of children. Yeah. Uh, lots of prams whizzing yeah. around. And, you know, it takes time for a community to sort of settle and build like that. And I, when, when we're looking at, you know, the next phase of East Village, I'm already thinking, so we're going to have some teenagers in, yeah. in East Village at, at scale, not too far from now. You're not just running the bricks and mortar. You're not just giving someone a great experience. Because yeah. remember, our residents can leave at any time yeah. on two months' notice but, if they're not getting a great experience. But I experience. suppose that, that's the potential journey. But I suppose in terms of what you've become well known for are for um, younger audiences, I suppose, that have, have, have come into um, a Get Living um, neighbourhood. And I was thinking, is there a parallel here between how, say, City, so I'm from Sheffield, um, Sheffield got a reputation as a great university town yeah. and actually the energy, the palpable sense of energy of having a lot of young people living in that city um, is a big part of its appeal, not, not just for the students that come there, but I think for the overall sense of energy of, of the place. I mean, do you see yourself as part of that kind of trajectory that actually you're part of the wider destination cell now for the way places develop and, and sell themselves for the future? 
I mean, you really have to earn your right to be part of the civic family in yeah. which you then suddenly reside. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when we're doing Lewisham or Newmaker or now, you know, Birmingham and Maidenhead and, and, and Elephant and Castle in particular, you know, we've got people in our team who spend a long time investing in those relationships with the local authorities, with the civic groups, with the community groups, and, and everybody else who's got a stake in a particular yeah. neighbourhood and community. Uh, it's uh, really important because we're in it for the long term. Yeah. Do you talk to communities about the stage that you're trying to build? I mean, the stage that you're trying to sort of set for a place that may not have had a get living development and may not know what it's going to get. I mean, you mentioned... Yeah, so if, if I think about the last few years, I mean, built to rent's pretty new. Yeah. And when you're going in and you're trying to get a planning permission for something, I think a lot of people just associate with the house builder that will get the best consent possible, build it and disappear over the rise and when, when it's all sold. And so I've spent a lot of time in planning meetings and in front of um, you know, public meetings and uh, in planning committees, trying to say that we're different. Mm. And the fact that we're long-term... How do you explain it? Is, is it just the long-term or is there... Well, it's, it's the benefits that accrue from being right. a long-term uh, owner. So if you can go in and say, look, we're here for the duration. So um, it's not just the economic value that we're here because we do have to compete for yeah. the hundreds of millions of pounds worth of capital it required to build these things. And of course, we're working for institutional pension fund investors. Uh, but I suppose their... this then brings this point about that you've got to be a performance business as in you've got, to, you've got to deliver the financials but there's also a more purposeful point about I suppose what you're actually trying to do by, so by putting these developments purpose together. Purpose is axiomatic to mm. motivating everybody who's got a stake in this business not just the people that work at Get Living but mm. all the suppliers and consultants that, that help us do what we want to do but equally just to go back to your question when I'm sitting there in front of local authorities or community groups or whatever say so because we are long term because we are really producing uh, a neighbourhood and homes for people in an environment where there's a massive shortage of homes, we, are, we have a vested interest in making sure that the specification of homes is higher Yeah. because the repair bill is generally ours. We have an, a vested interest in making sure that the environmental credentials of what we do are higher. We have a, a vested interest in making sure that the social value that we can generate is higher. And we have a vested interest in making sure that the public realm always looks yeah. fantastic. And, that, and, and we, have a pub, we, have a, we have a vested interest in making sure that the retail on the ground floor, which is a very small percentage of our overall revenue, still looks magic and vibrant because that's what drives the interest and the loyalty on, it, on, on everything that sits above the ground floor. Even though you're a long-term in, um, investor in a place, you're also creating neighbourhoods at pace, right? When you are coming in and sort of, you know, I suppose bringing that energy, that sense of change, um, and actually that sense of neighbourhood creation at pace. What have you learned along the way in terms of how to do it well? Well, owning all of the real estate inside a red line um, and then, carries and the, a responsibility yeah. for sure, but it actually gives you massive opportunity that owners of more individual properties would never have. Yeah. So there's a massive opportunity in that. And it goes back to what I was saying about being long term and really delivering not just the economic, but the environmental. And, and the social I mean, you're right that. about about sort of like Cadbury's and also. But I mean, you look at some of these great estates is that they were built with a real sense of master plan. Yeah. And, you know, even down to like Lutyens, the architect and yeah. all those sorts yeah. of, you know, I suppose that that sense of actually we're going to create a very clear sense of identity for a place. I mean, that, and, and, on, and on that, it's not always about the architecture. Hmm. I mean, I know real estate people are, you know, obsessed about the architecture and why not? It's, 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 it's stuff that's very permanent yeah. and we want to create things that are beautiful. But I, I always remember, you know, when I had really great conversations in my <laughs> younger years with people like Terry Farrell, who yeah. really understood about master planning and, and placemaking. And Martha Schwartz, if you've ever come across her amazing landscape architect, it's always about the spaces between the buildings that generate the feel, the vibe, yeah. the energy, the mojo. It's not just, I suppose, the bricks and mortar that they put up, but the vibe, the energy, the sense of how it works in in macro, not just the micro of yeah. the individual property. And look, these things are always evolving. Mm. I mean, you, you know, we've got here at East Village the Olympic Park. Mm. I mean, it, it, it needs refreshing, and yeah. we, we're actually about to embark on that. So, 
you're constantly evolving these things yourself all of the yeah. time. This, was, this is very open space because it was built for thousands of athletes and, and we can create spaces where people can have quiet reflection, read a book. Yeah, and uh, uh, I suppose this, this is all the, the big attraction of East London is that it's, it's a sense of the space space to do things differently, to do things at scale, to do things in a way that when you're feeling quite cramped and quite sort of like, quite sort of like tied up like other parts of London are, this, this is a place you can experiment, I and guess. And who's got 25 acres of open space in yeah. East London like a this? Absolutely. Under single ownership. Yeah. It is an amazing opportunity. Did the Athletes Village help you establish the game plan for the neighbourhoods that have come after that? I mean, did it, did it give you a perspective about how you do this well, or, 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 or do they look very different? Uh, no, actually, if, if you go to Newmaker, and if you go to Maidenhead, and actually now if you go to Lewisham, certainly Elephant, you can look at them and go, yes, there's lots of echoes of East Village in those. Yeah. Um, so the, the homes, you know, tend to be fairly similar design, because we know what works. The realm, I mean, this is exceptional. We've got 25 acres here. We don't have 25 acres in many other places. But the way the realm works, the vibrancy you create, is definitely uh, something that we know residents really value. So that, and then the ground floor domain, all of the cafes and bars and restaurants uh, are critical to that sense of place, that sense of belonging that we've been talking about. We're going to make, if you look down here, you yeah. know, this is quite intimate. It's, it's, it's got a, a real beauty about it. This space here is probably a bit too baggy and we're going to remodel some of the central square so that it becomes a little bit tighter, a little bit more intimate. And, and actually what you know, we did a few years ago is understand that you've got to put more things in the space to make it slightly messier. Mm. Um, because that, that brings an informality and a, and a comfort to the place rather than when you start on these things, they can be very synthetic. I mean, let, let's, let's go back to what gets you here because I mean, you know, that's all I'm sort of thinking about is that, you know, we talked about Mojo and, and the Mojo Man column, right? right? And this idea about energy and the kind of, I suppose, the positivity, um, these sort of intangible parts of, of the character. I mean, this is very much your story, I think, in terms of the energy you bring in terms of your, your style. Has that always been the case? I mean, is that, I, I mean, it strikes me there's a competitive element to your, to your nature. I've got world-class investors. Yeah. I'm surrounded by people of so great, great energy team. and yeah. intellect. I've been lucky enough that I've built a team of incredibly energetic, intelligent, insightful, entrepreneurial people. If you're, you know, doing things like East Village and Lewisham and Elephant and Castle, and you've got a lot of young people living in your homes, they themselves have a whole energy. It's hard not in this environment. Okay, so for, so for people trying to get a sense of what makes you tick, so the team matters, the people around you matter, but I also think that velocity, that pace matters in terms of actually how do you give that sense of ambition, that sense of going for something. Is, is that fair? I do get up every morning and um, am highly motivated and driven that it gives occupations for the people that work for us a real sense of purpose and reward and fulfilment mm. in, in not just financial terms, but in terms of uh, intellectual and, and, and emotional terms. I say, you, if you're dealing with all these residents, they can vote with their feet on two months notice. So you have to work very hard yeah. to make sure that they have a great time and that Google scores reflect that. It, it, it's, it's unlike anything else I've done in real estate. You, you've just got to be completely on your game. You've got to be across the detail and you've got to be permanently looking at how you can make something but, better. But I suppose what I'm trying to get to is what, what gets you into this type of real estate, into this type of role, um, what are the kind of, the, I suppose, the, the, personal, the personality traits that sort of get you to here? Because I think, you know, we were talking off camera is that, you know, you've always had an interest in, in the built environment, you know, actually making things, creating things. I mean, there's, a, there's obviously a, a creative element that has been with you from the earliest days. Yeah, I mean, I, I do love making and building things. Yeah. There's, there's no... We were saying like Meccano, Lego. All that. of that stuff. And, and honestly... Homes for 10,000 people. I can still go on a building site today, you know, four decades on, and I still get a thrill. I mean, I suppose... So last question, Rick. I mean, you know, I suppose looking at what you've done is 
as a team builder and a business builder, as a neighborhood builder, um, gives you some perspectives um, about um, how to do things well. We are facing a general election, who knows when, who knows at what point of, um, of the year, of, of this year ahead. How does Britain get its mojo back? How yeah. do we inspire productivity, change? How do you see that on a nationwide perspective? I mean, is there a, is there a formula that you'd share or a view that you'd share in terms of actually how we could do this really well? So housing's very political. And I've had this year particularly, for the reasons everybody might understand, um, a lot of engagement with politicians, policy makers and, and government generally. I guess I meet a lot of politicians and you could look at them and go, um, good on you for putting yourself up for this and, and wanting to be a sort of public servant and try and do the right thing. But the system somehow crushes them. Mm. If I wasn't flat out on the day job, I would love to write the whole holistic strategy for how we <laughs> solve the housing crisis and help this, 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 attract... This whole interview might become your big job application. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very happy with what I'm doing. But I, I just don't think government, parliament, politics facilitates the ability for those who are charged with doing it, the opportunity to take time to yeah. listen, to it's think really I, deeply I think, and spend the yeah. time sorting the problem, which is what we do every day. Yeah. Is, is it, you know, I mean, a lot of this conversation has been about time, about doing things over the long term, about doing, I mean, there's been a lot about actually um, how you, maybe, maybe that is right, is that there's well, no short term fixes. You've got to use time you've well. You've always got a choice of doing something, you know, at an exemplary level or adequately. Why wouldn't you just want to do it really, really well? Uh, it's a competitive thing. You, you want to be the best you can be. And to do that, takes a lot of preparation, takes a lot of thought, takes a lot of collaboration, takes a lot of ingenuity and, and um, acumen. Uh, so spend your time, do it well. It, it, it's, it's a choice. Why, why wouldn't you want to do it the best? Right, Rick, 20th floor to the ground floor. Right. Get a living elevator pitch. Literally the elevator pitch. Yes. My goodness. Uh, the elevator pitch to a resident is if you want to live in any get living home, you will get a fantastic choice of apartments of the highest quality in a really safe, very vibrant public realm with exemplary service. But most of all, come and live in a get living home if you really want that sense of belonging. That is perfect because the doors have just opened. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's go.